Welcome to EPG Patshala. Under African and Caribbean writing, we are now dealing with Nadim Godimer's July's People. I'm Dr. Mridila Lakaraju, Assistant Professor, Osmania University. In this module, we'll be learning about Nadine Godimer's biographical details, her works, influences, and background in which her book, July's People, is situated. White South Africans, in a way, are born twice. They have the white world which they are born into, and as they grow up, they develop an understanding of the real South Africa, the real Africa. She further adds, if you had any intelligence, you began, even as a child, to question everything about the way you were living. This helps us positioning Nadine Godimer and provides insights into the socio-political influence on her writings. Born in a racially divided South Africa on 20th November 1923 at Springs near Johannesburg to immigrant parents because Nadine's mother Nan Myers, born in England, and her father, Isidore Gordimer, was a Jew who emigrated from Lithuania at the age of 13. Gordimer grappled with the question of identity from early on. She grew up in a small mining town in Transvaal amidst late colonial world social conventions. In June 1937, at the age of 13, Nadine Gordimer's first published fiction appeared. Since 1949, Godimer has published across genre. Literary recognition for her accomplishments culminated with the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1991. Through her fiction, she has become the interpreter of South Africa, as over the years, her country has marched down its doom-ridden slope of apartheid. She traveled wildly, especially in Africa, but Johannesburg remained her home. She was a visiting lecturer at many universities, including Harvard and Princeton. In South Africa, she joined the African National Congress when it was still listed as an illegal organization by the South African government. Godimer saw the ANC as the best hope for reversing South Africa's treatment of black citizens. An activist and writer throughout her life, several of her works were banned, censored under the apartheid and post-apartheid era. She has written extensively on this issue in several of her essays, especially censored, banned, and gagged in the collection The Essential Gesture. July's People was also banned under apartheid and faced censorship under the post-apartheid government as well. A provincial education department temporarily removed July's People from the school reading list along with works of other anti-apartheid writers, describing July's people as deeply racist, superior and patronizing, a characterization that Godimer took as a grave insult and that many literary and political figures protested. We now come to her work. Godimer's fiction is accompanied by an extraordinary body of non-fictional writing. July's People has its roots in the essay titled Living in the Interregnum. The novel was published 13 years before the official demise of apartheid. The questions that Godimer concerns herself with in the essay are expounded in great depth in the novel. Questions like, what would happen to the whites when the apartheid regime goes away? How could the minuscule section of society of whites that plans to stay on be of help to the new collective life within the new structures? Also, how the whites need to discard their racist lenses and perceive the world afresh, while the whole society is being restructured in black consciousness. She felt that the attitude of the white South Africans had to undergo a sea change. Now we come to the political background to July's people. The Soweto Revolt, Afrikaans and July people. It would be judicious to note the specific political milieu in which Berger's daughter and July's people were set. These works appeared after the terrible Children's Crusade in 1976. The Soweto uprisings led by school-age protesters seeking to purify the consciousness of their elders. The proverbial last straw on the camel's back proved to be the government's decision of using Afrikaans 
instead of English as the language of instruction in some African schools, thus restricting the access of the blacks to the wider world and forcing them to learn the native language of apartheid. Thus, both the novels are influenced by these developments. Consequently, translating in a major shift in Godimer's view of her situation as a South African and a writer. In this quadrant, we will be introduced to the important characters in the novel, July's People. July, the caretaker, host and provider. July is the black houseboy serving the smales. It is after him that the novel takes its title. July accommodates the smales family at his native place when a civil war rages in Johannesburg. He is able to switch roles dexterously, especially during his confrontations with Maureen as he doesn't wish to break the hierarchy and he doesn't wish to enter any other relationship with the whites. As he is recognized that the base of their relationship is purely materialistic. The power play. The smales squirm at the thought of relinquishing one of their symbols of power, that is, the baki, a car, to July, who actually uses it to fulfill their needs. The apparent shift in power from smales to July reforms the crux of the narrative and the incessant mental and verbal battles between Maureen and July serve as the new battleground. He does his duty of taking care of the Smales untiringly all through. The second character is Bamford Smales, an architect by profession. Bamford Smales is pushed into passivity in the interregnum. Unlike Maureen who visits the past to make peace with the present, Bam doesn't feel he has been guilty at all. The Baki and the shotgun, which are the focus of power, belong to Bam. The keys to the Baki proves to be the bone of contention. The dissonance and the complete breakdown in the Smalls' relationship, especially during the testing time, bears the moral and spiritual vacuity in their lives. Bam's shivering hands at the loss of his gun capture his helplessness and resigned acceptance of the situation, which further lower him in the eyes of his wife and children. Maureen Smales, Bam's wife. Maureen Smales is the ma major consciousness of the narrative and the most interesting character. In the interregnum, there is an explosion of roles. This is difficult for Maureen to accept as previous titles do not hold any longer, due to which a loss of power and a resultant vacuity are experienced. Maureen shares a formal relationship with July. She feels she is very democratic with July. However, this illusion is broken by July throughout the confrontations that take place between them. The period that she spends at July's native place forces her to revisit her past guilt, including all instances of improper behavior with the blacks, be it by her father when he speaks disrespectfully to the boys in the mines, or by her when she gives July the ugly things that she doesn't require. However, this doesn't help in accepting her situation. On the contrary, it disconnects her from all her relationships, thus reflecting a lack of inner strength in handling crisis. Finally, she runs like an animal, working on instincts towards an uncertain source of hope that arrives in the form of a helicopter. The Smales' Children the Smells' children do not face an identity crisis as the seniors. They are the only ray of hope, providing hints of possibility of a post-revolutionary rebirth. They make friends, learn local expression, mannerisms, and learn to eat with their hands. Their love for July remains constant. July's wife, Martha, and his mother. Martha has accepted July's absence. In fact, finds his presence strange. She has adapted to the situation. July's mother is wary of the whites. She feels they're not to be trusted. She leads a life of harmony with nature. In this quadrant, we look at the plot of Nadine Godimer's July's People. Caught between two worlds, one dead and the other powerless to be born. These lines from the Grand Chartreuse by Matthew Arnold aptly sums up the state of the white Smallsy's family that had fled Johannesburg and has sought refuge in their black male servants, July's native place. With the civil war raging in Johannesburg, the position of the white South Africans is precarious. The family lives in a yellow baki, 
armed with money and basics like toilet paper rolls, malaria pills, the shotgun and radio, the family sets out on a forced quest. The smales are accommodated in July's grandmother's hut. The well-to-do smales find it difficult to adjust in the utterly unhygienic and impoverished conditions. Maureen Smales resorts to visiting her past to make sense of the present as that is what is certain. July, in spite of mild remonstrations from his family, continues to be the host and provider of the Smales. Bam Smales lives in the constant fear of being spotted by the villagers or outsiders. As days pass by, he slips into passivity as he has failed as the family's provider. The first thing that July does is to check, take charge of Baki to visit the Indian grocery stores that is at a distance. The keys remain with him. That is what becomes the bone of contention due to which cracks starts appearing in the ideal relationship that July shares with the smales. The first time he keeps the keys with him and takes the Baki without informing the smales is followed by confrontations between Maureen and July wherein the veneer of liberalism that Maureen wears is brutally torn asunder. The first confrontation between July and Maureen takes place. She experiences a sadistic triumph when she asks one of her children to ask July to see her. Go and say, I want to see him. Maureen accuses July of having deserted Ellen, July's town woman. July in turn accuses Maureen of not understanding and trusting him. Maureen uses simple and concrete language while communicating with July. July gives a fitting reply about Ellen to Maureen and walks away with the key. From here on, small cracks turn into big fissures. The next confrontation takes place when Maureen wanders towards the vehicle that July is working on. Maureen questions July whether he's scared that she should reveal his wife about his town woman, Ellen. July is infuriated and says there's nothing to tell as he was her houseboy for 15 years and she was satisfied with him. The final confrontation is when the gun along with the cartridges get robbed from the thatched roof of the house. Bam's hand starts shivering at the loss of the last symbol of authority about which Maureen feigns in ignorance and she sets out to question July. Their last confrontation takes place when she accuses him of having designs on the backy. She gets hysterical and there is high drama. July, for the first time, speaks in his own language, which, although she doesn't understand, she follows what he means. He speaks from where he is seated, from his own place. He accuses her of not understanding him or recognizing him. She couldn't as she was not his people. Also that, his measure as a man was taken elsewhere and that she has no grasp of his real identity about who he as a person is. The novel witnesses breakdown of several relationships. Maureen and Bam, they completely stop communicating. The intimacy shared at Johannesburg is lost. In fact, at a point in the novel, they're described as diverse people meeting on a regular basis to keep up a semblance of family life. Physical ugliness perhaps is a reflection of the mind. We witness Maureen in the rawest forms, unhappy with her physical looks. Similarly, the coarse and unpleasant sign of life is revealed, the test, which Maureen is unable to pass. She finally buckles under pressure and is ready to give herself up to unknown forces present in the helicopter that appear at the end of the novel. The children are the only ray of hope. They make friends, they learn local expression and language, and their love for July is undeterred, since their love is of the purest form. All through the novel, Gordimer doesn't refer to the actual violence that takes place at Johannesburg. It is only through bit and pieces of radio coverage that we come to know about the unstable political condition. Gordimer's book, July's People is a complex, a scathing commentary on the white liberals, indeed powerful. In this quadrant, we will be evaluating themes that are central to the discussion of the novel. Communication as a theme. 
Several critics of the novel have remarked on the centrality of the theme of communication and language in July's people. Language occupies a major role in any revolutionary change. The inadequacy of language is revealed when Maureen realizes how baseless her belief in having understood July in the past is, as when she finally seems to have understood him. It is in a language that is completely unknown to her. The final confrontation reveals the absolute need for communication, where Mavate lashes out at Maureen in her own mother tongue, which she, although doesn't follow, she understands. Maureen realizes that it would have been more pragmatic to have learned Fanaglo, the black lingua franca of the minds, than having learned ballet that could have helped her assimilate well with July's people. The breakdown in communication between the smales is also one of the main concerns of the novel that is the ultimate signifier of the death of their relationship. Martha and July don't really share anything in common. They lead disconnected lives. Both are used to each other's absences. In the midst of the conversation with July, she finds that he has trailed off. However, she doesn't know where to find him. His other life is known to her only through pictures, the context to which remains unknown. Gender roles in July's people. Andre Brink has carried out a perceptive study on the gender roles in the novel. According to him, the roles assigned to the white and black, male and female, have been predefined by patriarchy. In the South African context, present in July's people, patriarchy coincides and goes hand in hand with apartheid. At the very outset of the novel, there is not only a territorial displacement, but also two gender displacements. Gender roles are blurred, wholly, and so are the boundaries between white, black, male, female. As the narrative unfolds and its space becomes more and more clearly defined by patriarchy, we witness an uneasy gendering. Absence filled by matriarchy. The subservient role played by black male characters as the madam's good boy, deprived the male of much authority, is explored well by Bailey. This role playing by the black man creates a vacuum of power which can be filled by matriarchal rather than the traditional patriarchal interventions. July's women carry out the roles assigned to them by patriarchy. At the same time, they establish a separate identity, challenging patriarchy in their own terms. The presence of male only in the form of money sent every month forces the woman to fulfill their otherwise latent potential. July still wields power among his women, but his status is increasingly precarious. His wife, for instance, wants to know whose bidding he moved around, whose orders he followed at Johannesburg. Sheila Roberts has observed that the choice of black male servant is a purposeful choice on part of Gordimer, as it adds another dimension of race and gender to the already complex relation between blacks and whites. Situated in the interregnum, the novel undertakes a study of stripping of roles. Bam's story in the narrative comprises mainly a fall from masculine grace. Maureen recites in her attempts painfully to break out the female constraints patriarchy has assigned to her. The interregnum poses a new challenge for July's black women as they have to get used to July's presence and have to redefine their roles accordingly. Brink suggests that Maureen's power and authority are derived from the fact that she is white. July's women derive their power from the fact that they are women. Materialism in July's People as a Theme July's People is a scathing commentary on the liberal, materialistic whites. Gordimer expresses, Nothing made them so happy as buying things. They had no interest in feeding rabbits. Maureen finds it difficult to accept the impoverished conditions of the rural South Africans. The Smallses fail to acknowledge that their material well-being is due to the discriminatory policies of apartheid. They vainly clutch onto the vestiges of power even when they have lost everything. The novel's end. The novel's ambiguous 
end reflects the obscurity of the situation in which the characters lose their belonging and mooring as historical coordinates don't fit life any longer. In the absence of past structures, the characters display a range of morbid symptoms. Roland Smith suggests that flight from impasse is a common feature at the end of Nadine Gordimer's fiction. Confronted with denial of values assumed in the past to define herself and her marriage, Maureen Smales flees headlong, irrationally, in the final pages of the novel towards the undefined and possibly illusionary escape of a lone, unidentified helicopter that lands near the village. She has lost everything. Maureen's flight from her family, her past, and July reveals an even more radical collapse of identity. Running is her ultimate affirmation of being. She runs away from the roles assigned to her by patriarchy. This is her choice, the choice offered by Nadine Gordimer. In this module, we have looked at Nadine Gordimer's details, the historical background in which the novel has been set, the characterization, the major themes from which the novel can be interpreted. For further information, the additional resources at the end of the e-text can be referred to. Thank you.